Welcome, Dr. Epic here. What we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to talk about Leviathans, the City of New Orleans, the English Bill of Rights, and exactly who or what is the true enemy of human liberty. And to do that, we're going to follow the outline right up above. We're going to talk about Thomas Hobbes. We're going to talk about John Locke. We're going to talk about Baron Montesquieu and how your favorite subject and mine, 18th century political philosophy, addressed this question of why do we have a government? Now, in this class, this is all done in service of the question that is right above my head. Why do we have a government? Explain the Enlightenment reasoning for a government. What are these political philosophies? Uh, and how do they appear in the six main documents of the American founding? And what did James Madison write about the reason for government? Importantly, what part of the philosophies do the American founders change? So, we're in the 18th century. Oh, a little bit in the 17th century, too. Um, the question is, why do we have a government? Uh, it is clearly not God selecting the rulers of nations. Divine right of kings is complete nonsense. So, it's the Age of Enlightenment. So, the political philosophers are going to say, well, this is a problem. We're going to apply our reason to this problem. And as we come up with three different but related solutions to why do we have a government, I want you to keep in mind these questions up above. Of these three guys, Hobbes, Locke, and Montesquieu, which one of these guys most clearly matches your own ideas? Which one of these ideas do you think could actually function? And do any of these ideas completely repel you? Keep that in mind as we move through these things and see how well some of their philosophies align with the ideas that you wrote down from the previous quiz. We'll start with this fine fellow right up above me, Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes was a philosopher of the uh, 17th century. And Thomas Hobbes tackled this problem. Why do we have a government? He expressed these philosophies in a book called Leviathan, or The Matter, Form, and Power of a Commonwealth, Ecclesiastical and Civil. And this was published in 1651. And in the Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes makes three main points. One, he talks about the state of nature of humans. And what he says is that people are inherently evil. Left to their own devices, people are selfish, they are cruel, they are brutish towards one another. And left alone, humans on an empty landscape will behave absolutely beastly towards one another. If someone has something that someone else wants, they will just kill them and take it. That's Thomas Hobbes' view of the essential nature of humanity. He describes that the state of nature, the, the how people were before they had government, as a, state of, uh, as a state of war of all against all, which is to say every person was at war with every other person. And life in this state of nature he describes as nasty, brutish, and short. So, but there's a solution, Thomas Hobbes says. There's a solution to this horrific state of nature. And the solution is the Leviathan. He says, okay, this monster appears, the Leviathan. And humans enter into a social contract with this monster. And what the monster says is, okay, you are going to surrender a lot of your personal freedom, and you're going, to sur you're going to give this monster, the Leviathan, tremendous power. And, it's gonna, and you're going to give the Leviathan power over you. And in return, the Leviathan is going to do point three. The Leviathan will keep you safe from your fellow people. The Leviathan will deliver safety and security. And the more power and more wealth you give the Leviathan, the greater, it, the greater its ability to keep you safe and secure. Now, the Leviathan is not really, you know, some hideous monster. The Leviathan, as you can tell uh, from the illustration on the left, that huge 
thing right there with the sword and the scepter, that's the Leviathan. The Leviathan is government. It is this monster that appears that basically forces people to be nice to one another. It forces people to be civil to one another. And people don't murder and steal and rob because they are afraid of the power of government. They don't go out and kill someone and take their stuff because they know that the government will find them and punish them. So that's Hobbes' three points why we have a government. Because people live in a brutal state of nature, then they enter into a social contract with government and surrender wealth and power to the government, and in return, the government keeps them safe and secure from each other. It's the government that will protect you. And the more rights you can give up to the government, the more it can protect you. And governments are established by force and main maintain a civil society through fear of that force. It's Thomas Hobbes. Now, is Thomas Hobbes still relevant today? And the answer is, yeah, kind of. Uh, I mean, certainly Thomas Hobbes was cited quite uh, extensively uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. Now, this was a while back, but basically, if you, don't, if you don't remember it, this mass monster hurricane came out of the Gulf of Mexico, clobbered the city of New Orleans, flooded the city. And the New Orleans government, and especially the New Orleans Police Department, ceased to exist. And the city became a scene of complete anarchy. People were breaking into stores. They were looting them. They were murdering each other in the street. People were being raped at gunpoint. New Orleans itself descended into what people called a Hobbesian state of nature, which is to say that the state of nature that Thomas Hobbes describes, where every person is in a war with every other person, and life is nasty, brutish, and short. And people wrote articles about this, the Leviathan in New Orleans. There was a national outcry. People couldn't believe what they were seeing on the news. A major American city reduced to a state of disaster, need, privation, and complete anarchy. And just if, if New Orleans became a Hobbesian state of nature, the government, the federal government, and the state of Louisiana responded with the Leviathan. And there on the lower left, there you see, that's the Leviathan imposing order on the city of New Orleans. Men with uniforms and guns going from street to street, shutting down illegal activity, taking aim and pulling triggers. The army rolled into New Orleans together with the state police, established order in the city. The Leviathan arrived and provided safety and security for the citizens of New Orleans. In fact, you can go on YouTube and you can type in, you know, the, the army in New Orleans and you can pop up with these videos. It's kind of shocking of armed foot patrols of soldiers with weapons. They don't have magazines. Uh, with, you know, these rifles walking down the street in New Orleans, going door to door, making sure people know that the Leviathan has arrived. Now, this, a lot of people, a lot of students don't really like Thomas Hobbes. They find him, his view of humanity to be very dark. They find his view of the world to be really, really cynical. Um, and part of this is explained with the, the, the time period that Thomas Hobbes lived through, which is to say that Thomas Hobbes lived through the horrors uh, of the English Civil War. Uh, Thomas Hobbes saw cities get burned. He saw whole villages get sacked. He watched people being murdered, robbed, uh, raped, and chopped to pieces. Uh, he lived through this, this brutal conflict of the English Civil War. And that colored his view of humanity. That is, to Hobbes, that's what people are really like. And we like to think of, uh, you know, in the 21st century, we like to think of people as being a little better than that, but... You know, which of us lived through brutal civil wars? I mean, I never have, certainly. That's Thomas Hobbes. Now, as we roll on, two or three, gen two or three generations later comes, well, actually, just the next generation, comes the second of our major philosophers, John Locke. And that's him up there with those gorgeous locks of hair. 
John Locke um, read Sir Robert Filmer's book about the divine right of kings. It's the book we mentioned in the last lecture. And John Locke really, really, really hated this book. And, you know, I said this last time that uh, Robert Filmer writes this terrible book, and the book itself has been largely forgotten, but Robert Filmer's terrible book that is defending the divine right of kings triggers a response from John Locke, who proceeds to write one of the greatest books ever written about political philosophy, Two Treaties of Government, all right, which uh, Locke, published, Locke publishes in 1690. But he's already a very influential political thinker by the time he publishes Two Treaties. And what John Locke wants to do in this book is basically demolish the divine right of kings. He thinks that Robert Filmer is uh, a, a complete idiot, and there is no divine right of kings, and John Locke wants to establish this. So he writes the two treatises, and you can see Robert Filmer's name features quite prominently on the cover. John Locke, in two treaties, I mean, it's, it's a big book, and it has a lot of things in it, but for the purposes of this class, for the purposes that we're discussing, uh, John Locke hits on four major points uh, in the two treaties of government. One, he says that all people are born equal, okay? All people are born free and equal, and in a state of nature, generally behave well. John Locke did not live through the English Civil War. In a state of nature, people behave quite well with each other. They're, they are pretty much good, but more importantly, whether they're good or bad, John Locke argues, people are free. In a state of nature, people are free. They're free to say what they want. They're free to do what they want. Someone growing up without any person around on, you know, an abandoned island somewhere, he'll have the freedom to do and say anything he wants. And to John Locke, these things make up natural rights. That this person in a state of nature possesses several natural rights given to him by God. Okay? So humans are in a state of nature with natural rights given to them by God. However, this is point two. Of these rights, one of these rights is clearly more important than any other right. And that right is the right to property. And John Locke focuses on this concept, the right of property. And he says, this is the real natural right that people have. The ability to own their own body the ability to own a piece of land, and then to modify this piece of land to make it better and more productive and more beautiful and more pleasing to the eye. So you have a farmer on a landscape and he improves his land. He puts in a vineyard, he puts in an orchard, he diverts a stream, he raises crops. That is a fruitful pack of, that is a fruitful piece of land. That's a fruitful, That is a fruitful patch of land, and that is his God-given right to do that with his land. The most important of these natural rights, according to John Locke, is property. And you don't really own something unless you improve it. This is very important to John Locke, property. Which brings us to our third reason. And then government comes along, okay? This is not the overpowering, terrifying Leviathan of, of John Locke. Uh, of uh, Thomas Hobbes. Uh, to John Locke, the state is essentially a sheriff. It is someone who is going to provide law and order. But the purpose of this is to protect your natural rights. The government shows up and the individual person, our farmer on the landscape, surrenders wealth and surrenders freedom to the government. And in return, the government is going to agree to protect the natural rights given to him by God, given to him because God created him. And of course, the most important of these rights, property. And in fact, that's how John Locke argues how, how nations become rich. They protect property. That you go to somebody and you say, if you improve this piece of land, you can do anything you want with it and we'll never take it away from you. So the person is going to improve this land, and through the improvement of that land, then he can pay more taxes, and then the kingdom as a whole becomes more wealthy. Property, it's the, the centrality of property in, in, in John Locke's perspective. Now, and all of this hinges on Locke's fourth point, 
which is that a social contract then develops between the government and the people. The government says, we are here to protect the rights that God has given you. God created you and gave you these rights. Government comes along and we're going to protect these rights. We're going to make sure nobody can deprive you of life, liberty, or property. And the people agree to do this for the government. However, this is, this is important. This is the last bit. is very important for John Locke. If a government is unable to do that, if a government is unable to protect your natural rights, then that social contract can be revoked. All right? People can say, that government is no longer protecting life, liberty, and property. Therefore, we must dissolve the social contract and create a new one. Um, and this is what John Locke argues. During John Locke's lifetime, you know, they're, 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 they're basically agreeing and disagreeing with various kings that are in England. So the idea of being able to pick and choose your kings comes naturally with John Locke. Uh, here is one of the key quotes from the two treaties of government right up above me. And again, I would strongly urge you to write this down in your notes. It basically, it goes like this. It, at least from my perspective, nicely encapsulates Locke's four main points. All men by nature are equal in that equal right that every man hath his natural freedom without being subjected to the will authority or authority of any other man, all being equal and independent. No one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. And then you invite the government in and agree to surrender wealth and freedom to the government, and in return the government will protect your natural rights, the rights that God gave you when he created you. And again, historically what's going on in England is, is all that stuff we mentioned earlier. Kings coming and going, Parliament deposing one king and getting another one, deposing his heir and getting a third. And one of the documents that comes out of these England's picking and choosing its kings is our first document for the American founding, 1689. This is called the English Bill of Rights. And the English Bill of Rights was written uh, to legitimize the deposition of one king, James I, and the appointment of another, William of Orange. So, in a, in a, to use the logic of John Locke, James II is no longer able to fulfill the social contract he signed with the English people. He's no longer able to protect their life, liberty, or property. Hence, the English people have a right to dissolve the social contract they made with James II, kick him out of the country, which they do, and then invite someone new, William of Orange, then create a new social contract with their new king. People have a natural right to do that because the, the old king is not protecting their God-given natural rights. Now, the English Bill of Rights, you can go see it. I mean, it's, that's a picture of it right there uh, on the left. Um, uh, the English Bill of Rights is still around. Now, uh, it's, it's written in kind of early modern English, so I don't want to go over every single uh, bit of it. Uh, but here's basically a, a list of bullet points that I cribbed from history.com. You know, and, and you can read them up above. Some of them should sound quite familiar. Freedom to elect members of parliament without the king or queen's influence. Freedom of speech in parliament. Freedom from royal interference with the law. Freedom to bear arms for self-defense. The most important of these, though, is about three quarters of the way down. And this one gets really important, so definitely write this one down. The English Bill of Rights from 1689 explicitly says that the English people, using their rights as English, as citizens of the Kingdom of England, have freedom from taxation by royal prerogative, which is to say that the king just can't whistle up a tax, all right? For the king to create a tax, he needs the agreement of parliament. So king, the king needs to raise money. He goes to parliament says, okay, Parliament, we need to raise taxes. And Parliament is made up of the elected representatives of the people. So the people have a say in how they are taxed. Taxation, in other words, requires representation as per the English Bill of Rights 
in 1689. And even though the English Bill of Rights was written the year before the publication of two treaties, um, there is a lot of John Locke in the English Bill of Rights. The entire legitimacy behind the deposition of James I and the election of uh, William, William of Orange is the logic of John Locke. So like I said, there's going to be six documents and you're going to connect these three philosophies. I'll give you the first one. John Locke is heavily involved, or the logic of John Locke is heavily involved in the English Bill of Rights, 1689. This brings us to our third political philosopher of the 18th century. He's looking great, Baron de Montesquieu. Baron de Montesquieu is French. And Baron de Montesquieu uh, is, again, applying reason to solve this, solve this problem of why we have a government. And uh, if you haven't noticed by now, all three of these guys are borrowing, are borrowing from each other. Hobbes is first. Locke borrows a lot from Hobbes. And then de Montesquieu borrows a lot from both Hobbes and Locke. And the Baron de Montesquieu uh, writes this book, The Spirit of Laws, published 1748. And he's applying his reason to solve the problem of why we have a government. If kings do not rule by divine right, then why do they rule? And he, this is Montesquieu's answer to that. Montesquieu says, well, Locke is a little too hard. And no, Montesquieu says... Hobbes is a little too harsh, and Locke is a little bit too naive. Montesquieu is going to bring it home. And Baron de Montesquieu makes four distinct points in the spirit of the law. One, he talks about state of nature. How are people naturally, when they are created, if you find someone, if someone grows up alone on a desert island, how are they? Montesquieu argues that people are all born equal and free. At birth, everyone is the same. But, almost as soon as they are born, they, are, they grow up in a society that proceeds to make them unequal. Some people are born wealthy. Some people are born poor. Some people are born, you know, with physical gifts. Other people are born less physically gifted. So, and society values different traits differently. So people are born free and equal, but society makes them unfree and unequal, and it does so unjustly. So, government comes in. A government is there to, as a check on society. It is government's job to make sure, not that everyone is equal, but that everyone is free. So this is our second point, uh, according to Byron de Montesquieu. The point of government is the protection of personal liberty, the protection of personal freedom. People are born free. Society makes them unfree. It is the job of government to make them free again, to maximize personal liberty. And, you know, Montesquieu is, is okay with the natural rights of John Locke. He's like, they're, they're, that's all right. He's not so much into specifically what those rights are, but he's like, freedom is the ultimate right, not property. Freedom is the ultimate right. But this is where he differs from Locke. He says, look, this is where he differs from Hobbes, too. Really differs from Hobbes. This is what Montesquieu says, look, as a practical manner, People generally do not fear their neighbors. People, yeah, I'm sure you might get robbed or murdered by thieves or bandits or whatever. But primarily, the main threat to people's liberty and freedom doesn't really come from their neighbors. It doesn't come from thieves and bandits. People can deal with thieves and bandits on their own. This is Montague's very important point. Point three. The main threat to personal liberty is the government. It is government itself, people in government that grow cruel, they grow despotic, and they seek to steal the liberty of people away. Centralized states, powerful governments, conspire to diminish personal liberty. So, this is Montesquieu's logic. 
People are born free. Society makes them unfree. Government shows up to make to maximize personal freedom, but inevitably government becomes corrupt and then diminishes personal freedom. They become the evil that they sought to defeat. Government is the problem, Baron Mont Darren Montesquieu. Hence, the point of any governmental system should not be to rule well. It shouldn't be peace and prosperity. It shouldn't be defending natural rights. The purpose of any government is to maximize liberty. And the way you prevent governments from becoming despotic and cruel is you build a government so that it is constantly fighting with itself. You never concentrate power in one part of government, but rather distribute it equally to op opposing sectors of the same government. And here's some quotes from uh, the Baron de Montesquieu that sort of exemplify this. And you can see it right up above. Again, I'd highly encourage you to write these down. They'll make your notes look good too. In a state of nature, all men are born equal, but they cannot continue in this equality. Society makes them lose it, and they recover it only by the protection of the law. Okay? So people are born rich. So people are born equal, but then society makes them decides if they are rich. Society makes determines if they are poor. But to the government, to the law, they should be equal. Equal. That's the second quote. When the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or in the same body of magistrates, then there can be no liberty, because apprehensions may arise lest the same monarch or senate should enact tyrannical laws and execute them in a tyrannical manner. In other words, government, which is often the solution to the problem of freedom, becomes the problem itself. And to alleviate that problem, you cannot concentrate government you cannot concentrate power in any particular part of government. Now, this is back where it's, we're back to our, our philosophic quiz. Here we have our three guys, Hobbes, Locke, Montesquieu. In your personal opinion, who has the most reasonable approach? Who has the most realistic approach or the most workable? Is it A, Thomas Hobbes, the Leviathan. There's no correct answer. This is purely personal preference. B, John Locke, Two Treaties of Government. Or C, Montesquieu's The Spirit of Law. Again, all of this is in service to the question right up above. Why have a government? Explain the Enlightenment reasoning for a government. What are these political philosophies and how do they appear in the six main documents of the American founding? What did James Madison write about the reason for government? Importantly, what parts of the philosophies of do the American founders change? Now you've got all three of the main philosophers, and we've covered one of the six founding documents. Let's return to history for a bit. Let's get away from these fancy pants ideas about freedom and democracy, and, and, and I'm in this little yellow box, so let's just address history itself. French and Indian War, 1754 to 1763. Now, the French and Indian War was never meant to be this massive clash between the French and the, the, the French and the British empires. It, it started by accident. You had the French, which controlled parts of Quebec and the Great Lakes. You had the American colonies of the English along the East Coast. And basically a clash between the Virginia militia and French troops in Western Pennsylvania sets off the French and Indian War. And the French and Indian War rapidly spirals into this global conflict that in Europe becomes known as the Seven Years' War. And this is the fourth major war between the British and the French in the last 50 years. All throughout the 18th century, the British and the French are constantly clashing, battling back and forth with neither able to really sort of best the other. And it all comes to a head during the French and Indian War. Fighting deep into the woods of the Ohio Valley in western Pennsylvania, western Virginia, uh, Ohio, well, in the Ohio Valley, is a 
appears a 21-year-old officer in the Virginia militia, and he is George Washington. That's him. In, I think that's supposed to be him in blue right up above me. This is how George Washington spends his 20s, out in the, out in the woods, hanging out with tattooed Indians, talking with the French, attacking with the British. He wants a commission as a British officer, but they never give it to him because he's American. This is George Washington's college education. You know, he learns very, very hard lessons out in the frontier during the French and Indian War. He receives this very rough and violent education in tactics, fortification, and discipline. And he, his, his gifts start to really shine. He's not a brilliant tactician. He's not a brilliant maneuverer but he's someone who handles men well. And his, his great accomplishment is uh, he's with General Braddock uh, right up above, who becomes something of a mentor to George Washington. And Braddock is killed. That's, the painting right above me is the, is the death of General Braddock. He's the, he's the mortally wounded fellow in the center. And basically Braddock's army gets stuck in Western Pennsylvania. And basically the only person that can, that can save the army is General Washington. And his one great sort of tactical feat, tactical feat is sort of enabling this army to escape the French. And this is, he, this is going to be important. He knows how to keep an army together when it's on the run and badly beaten. And yeah, that's how he spends his 20s. And he emerges as one of the few American heroes of the French and Indian War. Everyone really likes how George Washington conducted himself on the frontier. But like I said, the French and Indian War becomes the Seven Years' War. And Europe calls it the Seven Years' War, you know, 1756 to 1763. And this war literally spirals into, the, into this global conflict. It's not just fighting the French and the Indians in the backwoods of the Ohio Valley. It extends all the way from Quebec down to the Caribbean. The British Navy sails to the south and battles it out over control of these islands, these sugar islands. Uh, it extends into Central Europe, where the German states, especially Prussia, uh, side with the English and have to fight, you know, both the Austrians and the French and the, the Russians, uh, led by Frederick the Great, who becomes one of the great kings of Prussia. And one of the English king, one of the English generals, that distinguishes himself through all this fighting in Germany is a guy who will be important later on named Lord Cornwallis. And he's one of the few really gifted uh, British generals. But it's not just, you know, in North America, down in the Caribbean, in Central Europe. There's also fighting all the way in India as the British kick the French out of India and establish a firm control of the Indian subcontinent itself, which is why in large parts of India today, they speak English. And the Seven Years' War ends in 1763 with the near and complete total defeat of the French. You know, the French lost four major, the French, you know, can give and take four major wars up until now, but in the Seven Years' War, the French are conclusively beaten. Quebec is captured and transformed into British Canada. France loses islands down in the West Indies. Prussia emerges triumphant in Central Europe, the, one of the premier German states. In fact, the emergence of Prussia will later allow the, the formation of Germany itself uh, in the 19th century. France is utterly and conclusively and decisively defeated. It is a massive defeat, and it is a massive victory for the British, but it is a victory that comes with tremendous cost, okay? To defeat the French, to decisively beat the French in the 18th century, the English had to spend money like there was no tomorrow. They had to borrow and spend massive and massive amounts of money. And as you can see, the chart up above me is the rate of British debt. You can see right when they get into that final gray zone, whew, that line goes straight up. That's the amount of money that Britain had to borrow to win the Seven Years' War, to win the French and Indian War. And 
they do win the war. But, and they control this vast new overseas empire. But that's an expensive empire. And winning the war was ruinously expensive. By the end of the war, by 1763, England, uh, the Britain is basically bankrupt. Uh, they're out of money. No one will lend them money. Now they suddenly have all these new possessions. India, Central Europe, North America. They've got this new place they're going to call Canada. Um, it is incredibly expensive. And it falls on the new British prime minister, that guy in the upper left named George Grenville. It falls on this guy to basically figure out what's going to happen in the post war world. And George Grenville, well, the problem with George Grenville is George Grenville is, is, I'm trying to think how to say this charitably because I made fun of those Kings in the last lecture. George Grenville is not an especially intelligent or talented person. He is, he's only prime minister for two years and he makes a, a massive screw up of the whole thing. Uh, Let's, yeah, let's just be nice about it. George Grenville is not intelligent. He is not competent. He doesn't really know what he's doing. And he ends up taking what would be a very severe challenge. I mean, you could give somebody who was incredibly talented and give him the task of, okay, you have, now you have to fund an empire. And oh, wow, your country's broke, by the way, and you owe all this money. Um, that would be a task for, that would be a hard job for somebody that was really, really good at their job. And, in, and for George Grenville, it's an impossible job. He's a, he, he completely screws it up. The first thing he screws up is the line of proclamation. So the French have been beaten in the Seven Years' War. They've lost Canada. They've lost their possessions in India. And they're signing a peace treaty. But the French want to make sure that their Indian allies in the Ohio Valley are taken care of. They don't want to abandon their Native American allies. They still want the Indian part of the French and Indian War taken care of. Britain wants to end the war. They've won it, but they're still broke and they have to figure out how to pay all their debts. So they agree that they're going to take, they're going to take care of the Indians in the Ohio Valley. Uh, and George Grenville's solution is to create something called the 1763 Line of Proclamation. And you can see it on the map over there. It's that dotted line that is between the colonies and the Indian Reserve of the Interior. George Grenville says, okay, we're to, to satisfy the French, to make sure that the, the, the French really don't start this war up again, we're going to take care of the Native Americans in the Ohio Valley. We're going to say, okay, the American colonies stop at the top of the Appalachian Mountains. Colonists cannot cross this line going from one side of the Appalachian Mountains to the other. The west side of those mountains are Indian territory forever and ever. And the French go, okay, we can live with that. And they sign, sign the peace treaty. The Americans hear about the 1763 line of proclamation and they flip out. Uh, George Washington is among them. They think this is absolutely outrageous. They're like, look, we just fought a war in those woods. We fought, the, you know, we, we spent men and treasure. We spent, the militia went out into the woods to fight the Indians, to fight the French. We beat them, we won the war. That land should be ours. We spent blood and treasure and lives to seize that land. And they're just gonna give it back to the Native Americans? The colonists are outraged. They literally view the 1763 line of proclamation as Britain taking the spoils of their victory away from them. And they point out to the British, if it was not for Washington, you guys would have lost that entire army in Western Pennsylvania. It's because of the Americans that enabled you to win this war in the woods. And now you're going to take all that land away. It's outrageous. It was just outrageous, at least to the Americans. And then George Grenville produces a pair of taxes. And these are the acts. This is the beginning of those infamous acts that runs up, that run up to the American Revolution. The first is the Sugar Act. And the Sugar Act basically is one of these laws that existed for a long time that no one enforced. Uh, you know, it's that existential question. If there's a law, that's never enforced, does it really exist? Uh, George Granville says, yes, that law exists, and we're going to enforce it because uh, we need the money. So what we're going to do is we're going to reduce the tax uh, 
to a more manageable area, but we're gonna we're gonna put boats, we're gonna put the British Navy off the coast uh, to intercept smugglers. This is incredibly unpopular. Uh, previous to this, people were directly importing sugar from the Caribbean uh, for their for their tea and their coffee. Um, and it was technically illegal, but they'd been doing it for a hundred years, so nobody cared. Suddenly people care. Suddenly people care a lot. And the Americans are really outraged at this. They're like, look, we won this war for you English guys. We won this war for you British guys in the woods. Now you're taking our land away. And now you're taxing us? Why are you taxing us? And then Grenville comes with the Stamp Act. And the Stamp Act is the camel is the camel that broke the straw's back. It's the straw that broke the camel's back. The Stamp Act, and there's the stamp right up above me. Well, it's, it's where the stamp used to be, is a tax on all published and all published material. And there are two big problems with these taxes. Uh, one, what are they for? And two, um, are they actually legal taxes? We'll take the first one. What are these taxes for? George Grenville says, look, we need all these taxes to raise revenue to pay off our creditors. And the other thing we need to raise taxes for is to maintain the British army. Because the British army, he, after winning these victories in North America, they leave parts of the British army scattered throughout the colonies. And this confuses the colonists quite a bit. They're like, look, What's the army doing here? Well, the army is there to protect you. But from the French, the French are gone. Well, from the Indians, we can handle the Indians. And a lot of suspicion grows about what those regiments of the British army are doing in the American colonies. And the second has to do with whether these taxes are actually legal. Because the British crown is doing something new in the American colonies, something it didn't used to do before. And this has to do whether you are taxing activity or individuals. Up until uh, 1764, the British Crown had always taxed economic activity, bringing, bringing sugar or bringing tea into America. They'll tax the ship. They're not going to tax individuals, all right? To buy a newspaper because it needs a stamp to be published, um... You're taxing an individual act. You're taxing the purchase of a newspaper, the purchase of a pamphlet. To buy a packet of sugar, you're taxing an individual, not the general activity of importation. And a lot of people start pointing out, this is, this is illegal. You can't. That's a violation of our rights. That's a violation of our rights as specified in the English Bill of Rights. One of the things they state is the, as Englishmen, we have the right of freedom from taxation by royal prerogative. You just can't put taxes on us and say those are new taxes now. You have to agree to par a parliament has to agree. And the British response was, well, parliament did agree. And this is where the colonists said, but we don't have representation in parliament. What acts as parliament in the colonies are our uh, colonial governments. So to tax us directly, to tax individuals, you have to go through the colonial government. Furthermore, they pointed out, according to the English Bill of Rights, you can't actually raise and quarter armies during peacetime. There are no enemies here. Those armies, all those British regiments in the colonies, those are there to threaten us into complying with your taxes. So you're basically forcing us to pay for the people who are going to scare us into paying taxes. And the American colonists get very, very upset at this. They, they, we won this huge victory over the French. We should get, we should get to enjoy all of the fruits of that victory. And instead of getting the fruits of this great victory over the French, they viewed it as getting kicked in the teeth. We're not allowed this land and now you're going to do all these taxes. And these taxes, you're not, they're not even legal taxes. You have no legal authority to give us taxes like that. And this is when things go from bad to worse. The British government is completely unresponsive and largely unsympathetic to the concerns of the Americans. 
The Americans are wondering why we fought this war for you guys. Why did we save this British army in western Pennsylvania? Why did we expend blood and treasure and send young men to die in the woods to attack Canada? If you're just going to oppress us and take away our God-given natural rights. If the king is not upholding his part of the social contract, it is time to dissolve that social contract. It's time to wreck some stuff. We're getting closer to an answer to this question up above. You've just been given a major puzzle piece, and we'll meet the rest in the next lecture when we start talking about how things go, what happens when things go worse. And I will see you there.